nights like this are good for meditation. If your thoughts go wandering outside, you run into the drizzle and the rain. So you come back in. If you're going to find any warmth, any well-being, it's got to be inside. This is a good principle to remember all the time, though, not just when it's rainy and drizzly. Real happiness is found inside. Things outside, as John Lee said, are the decorations that you see on the side of the road, but they're not the real essence. The real essence lies in here. This is where we take refuge. It's expressed in terms of taking refuge in the Buddha and the Dharma and the Sangha, but it basically it means taking refuge in their qualities. And developing those qualities inside yourself. And they're all qualities that are developed through the pursuit of happiness. The Buddha has three main qualities to talk about. There's wisdom, purity, and compassion. The wisdom, as he said, starts with that question, what when I do it will lead to my long-term welfare and happiness? What when I do it will lead to my long-term suffering and pain? What's wise about that is you realize that happiness comes from your actions, and long-term is better than short-term. This is why we're meditating, so we're looking for a long-term happiness. And we're willing to invest time and energy, put up a little pain in the legs, a little bit of frustration, and seeing the mind's not settling down quite right like we want it to. But if we stick with it, we find that the habits of the mind can change. And there really is a good long-term well-being that comes from all this. Even on times when the meditation doesn't seem to be going all that well, you're getting to know your mind. And as long as you stick with trying to figure it out, you'll have to come to an understanding. It's when you give up that there's no understanding. From wisdom then comes purity. If you want long-term welfare and happiness, it's going to have to depend on your actions, and your actions have to really be in line with what you want. In other words, actions that don't harm yourself, actions, <coughs> actions that don't harm others. And you have to look at your actions to make sure they really are in line with your principles. This is the essence of when the Buddha was teaching his son about how to purify his thoughts, words, and deeds. It was basically examining what you're doing, examining your intention, examining the results before you act, while you're acting, when you're done. And if you see you've made a mistake, okay, if it's something in word or deed, you talk it over with someone who's more advanced on the path. Make up your mind not to repeat that mistake. If it's a, just a thought, then you just be ashamed of having indulged in that thought, but then drop it. Keep on practicing. If you don't see any mistake, then the Buddha says take joy in the fact that your training is going well. That's how you achieve purity inside yourself. And then compassion, of course, comes from realizing that if your happiness depends on other people's misery, it's not going to last. If you want that long-term happiness, you've got to think about the happiness of others. This means in your actions and your words and your thoughts. You have goodwill for them and you want to express that. This is what the precepts are. It's an expression of goodwill. No killing, no stealing, no lying, no illicit sex, no intoxicants. When you follow these precepts, you're protecting yourself and you set a good example for others. It's interesting, the Buddha says, if you want to harm somebody, it's not so much harming them by killing or stealing or whatever. It's getting them to kill or steal or lie. That's when you've really harmed somebody. And you can help people in the other way around. So you give up drinking, your friends start to give up drinking, that's a good thing. You've actually helped your friends in a, in a really 
deep way, because now they have good karma. This is how you show compassion. So these are the three qualities we're trying to work on. Wisdom, purity, compassion as we practice. And these become our refuge as you develop these qualities within yourself. You've got the qualities of the Buddha inside. And notice they're based on the desire for happiness. The Buddha never has us be embarrassed about the idea that we want to be happy. He simply says, learn how to do it wisely. Think long term. Years back I was up in Canada and there was some First Nation people, some kids who just graduated from high school. And I happened to kind of come across them as they were having a picnic to celebrate their graduation. They wanted to talk about Buddhism. And they were drunk, so there wasn't much I could get through. But what I could get through, I thought, was think about your long-term happiness. Try to act skillfully for the sake of long-term well-being. Don't go just for the short term. If you want to boil down the Buddha's message, especially what it comes to, look for long-term happiness, and then think about the implications. And as I said, this is one of the reasons why we're meditating. Because sitting and meditating does require that you sit for long periods of time, and you keep with the practice. You hear that word, practice. It's like practicing the piano. You do it again and again and again. It's not that the rewards will all be at the end. You start getting to settle down with the breath, and getting a sense of what kind of breathing really feels good. You've got immediate visceral sense of well-being inside, and this is a huge support. We live in a rough world. And when I do good in the world, many times I get, we get thwarted. But you have to realize that the essence of your goodness doesn't get thwarted by things outside. The goodness is something that you have within. And working with the breath, getting the mind to settle down and be honest with itself about what's going on. That's how goodness begins. In fact, that's what the Buddha looked for in his students. He basically wanted people who were one, truthful, and two, observant. He said, bring someone who's, let someone who is observant, someone who is truthful, no deceiver, come, and I will teach that person the Dharma. So those qualities are the beginning of your goodness. And so we develop them here as we meditate. You've got to be true to yourself about what's going on true to your original intention to stick with the breath, and then observe it to see what's getting in the way. Any worries about the world outside, just put them aside. Think of them as being on the other side of all that rain and drizzle. Any thoughts about the sensual pleasures you're missing right now, put those aside as well. When the mind doesn't have those to think about, where is it going to go? It's going to look for pleasure here. This is the nature of the mind. It keeps looking for pleasure wherever it can. So you black off the, the unskillful avenues and say, okay, focus here, because this is skillful. It's going to require developing a skill. It's going to take time. But after all, what are you being asked to do? Breathe. Breathe comfortably. Breathe in a way that feels nourishing. If your heart feels heavy, breathe in a way that lightens it. If your energy level feels down, breathe in a way that gives you energy. If you're feeling wired, breathe in a way that calms you. Something very simple and very immediate. And that's one of the good things about it, is you can take it with you wherever you go. You have to remember that the meditation is not teaching you skills only for sitting here with your eyes closed. There are skills that you need all the time. How to breathe when 
things are getting difficult, how to breathe when things are nice. How to call your thoughts back when they're wandering off in directions they shouldn't go. And as you develop these skills and can carry them into the day, you find that you relieve yourself of a lot of suffering that would have happened otherwise. This is what the Buddhist teaching is all about. We live in a world of aging, illness, death, and separation, but he says we don't have to suffer from that. I received a letter from someone today. They'd been reading a book that was saying that the Buddha didn't really teach that craving is the cause of suffering. He's teaching that suffering is the cause of craving. And of course, suffering is something that's going to happen all the time, and so we have to learn how to accept our cravings and accept our sufferings. That's pretty miserable. One, it misrepresents the Buddha, and two, it closes off all avenues. It's like saying, okay, nothing gets better than this, so you just got to put, put up with it. But how do you embrace aging? How do you embrace death? These things are hard. How do you embrace separation? These things really do pain the mind. And the more you embrace them, the more you're going to suffer. That's learning there is an alternative. You don't have to get your mind investing all of its hopes for happiness in things that age, grow ill, and die, and are going to suffer separation. You've got something better here inside. You invest your time and energy there. So whatever the pains of the world, you don't have to suffer from them. the body of knowledge that the Buddha left behind. That's a huge gift, and we can avail ourselves of it. Even the suffering of death. It's interesting that when the Buddha is recommending how to talk to a person who's dying, it sounds very similar to basic meditation instructions. Don't worry about the affairs of the world. Put your mind at ease about those. Don't worry about your relatives, and don't set your mind on sensual pleasures that you're leaving. There's something better. Set your mind there. So you're getting practice and learning how not to suffer no matter what happens, even when death comes. This is how you handle it. Develop your concentration, develop your discernment. Try to do good in the world, but realize that the real goodness is what comes into the mind. The John Lee's example is you do good in the world, and the, it's like squeezing juice out of fruit. You take the juice and you leave the remains behind. Even though the remains of the fruit are nourishing, still the juice is the best part. to see the skill that we're working on as an essential skill, something in which you really can take refuge. And the more solid you are in this, the more true you are in your practice, and the more observant you are, the more you can become a refuge for other people, too. You know, we do take refuge in the Noble Sangha, and if we become members of the Noble Sangha, where it can be a refuge for others. So this is a practice that's good all around.